EOK podcast. It's been about a week, two weeks that we haven't had a guest or, you know, just done an interview ourselves. But um, as you may or may not already know, we had final exams. We're going to try and make them regular. Uh, yeah, we were sweating that. Well, I know that San was sweating that. San's finally yeah. graduated. Congratulations uh, to you. Thank you. Yeah, I finally graduated. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, so yeah. happy well, about well. it. But uh, today we've got a very, very special guest from AUIS as well. It's funnily enough, me, neither me or San have had him as a professor, but we've been so intrigued as because of all the you know conversations we've had with you. Like it's been it's been so intriguing to you know bring you on because you're a big Marvel fan and obviously you're an assistant professor what at AUIS. What makes you think that? What makes you think that? Yeah, but uh, you're a big Marvel fan and you're an assistant professor of world history at America at AUIS. And uh, you're a PhD, of course, as well. So, um, you know, he's raising the standards of our guests as well a lot. Yep. But, um, yeah, we're glad to be here. And we're glad that you're here as well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, gentlemen. Yeah, uh, it's funny. We, we, as I said, we never really had you as a professor. But we've noticed that, like, a lot of the students at AUIS tend to have this... Um, this connection with you that a lot of the other professors never seem to, to have had, especially online. Like we can tell that, you know, you do value this student and professor relationship, at least on a professional level. And uh, tell me, how do you think this has come for you as in like, do you think it's because of your interests in non-academic stuff, uh, well, as well as your, you know, uh, your ability in uh, acad academia as well? Uh, well, first of all, thank you both uh, yeah, for and so for it's having me at, uh, on, on your podcast. Um, been a fan since uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Jeff Gress's uh, interview with you guys. Thank and you also followed thank a bit you. with uh, with Ms. Goshan. You guys are doing a, a great job, so keep it up. Appreciate um, it. I just like uh, I just like talking to people, uh, and when they happen to me, my students, and I, I, uh, on top of that, I think I feel personally responsible for their intellectual development. That's why I got into this. Uh, this calling, it's not just a job or a profession, but this calling um, to, to basically, you know, help young people map their personal, uh, professional and, 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 you know, intellectual uh, map to, to, to sort of draw out a map for themselves and then go through it, you know, explore the land. Um, and, and I don't believe that, that my job in that respect really ends in the classroom. It doesn't start in the classroom, doesn't end in the classroom. Hence why I, 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 um, why I do like to interact with my students on you know, social media platforms. Um, I would, that's, that's what I would say, but maybe some of the stuff I do outside academia, you know, public commentary, uh, my uh, about two years of private sector uh, experience when I lived in, in Washington after I finished my doctorate uh, at the University of Virginia. Um, my being from this part of the world also, uh, yeah. for those of those viewers who may not uh, know me, well, should, should note that uh, I'm, I'm, from, I'm from Turkey, so I'm literally uh, across the border. Yeah, just, just downrange. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that that gives me a certain in with uh, AUIS students that, uh, that they may not have with some of my other colleagues. Another mm -hmm. advantage, of course, I have that. Even though I moved to Kurdistan for the first time in 2016, I did live in Iraq before. Um, uh, my father was posted to the Turkish embassy in Baghdad, and I lived there from 1985 till 1988. Right. And I started primary school there, actually, at the international school. Um, went there from first through third grade, and then we went back to Turkey. So I do have a connection uh, to the land directly myself. Um, I think all of that just a collection uh, of that stuff uh, I think makes the students uh, think that they, they sort of can approach me a of bit course. more easily. Yeah, I think it's, it's very valuable for a professor to have that. But you call it a calling and, uh, you know, a calling for you to raise the intellect and as well as, you know, um, probably raise the confidence of students. Why would you call it a calling? I mean, uh, is, it, is this something that you've always had a passion for from a young age? I'm not sure. Um, I, but honestly... Here's where I, I have to be honest about how I how I came to this. It was around the time of my second year in college. It was this was so this would have been 1998, 1999. Right. Um, right around the time most of you guys were just born, you know, still yeah. very tiny, and you know, dinosaurs were still walking the earth. You guys <laughs> don't remember that. I mean, it was a long time ago. Is what I'm trying to say. It surprised me that your second year in college was at 1989. That's not yeah. my style, by the way. 
Not 1989, 1990. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm not that old. No, I'm not 50. I'm not 50. I'm 40. That's a bit more believable. Okay. Yeah. Well, then again, not counting the whites. I have, for some reason, more whites on this side of my face than I do over here. So now, good, thank good. you also for making me sit uh, on this side of the studio. Um, I was, I was, I was inspired both by the very good professors I have. Um, the, the, the really great ones, the, 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 um, the ones who basically want to say, who make you want to say, my God, I want to be like this guy. I want to be like this gal. And some of the not so good ones are like, if this guy got a PhD from one of the best universities in the world or from one of the best universities in Turkey, come on, I can do this, you know, like with my eyes closed. Um, and once I got into that, once I had that mindset, um, uh, and I and I and I went into my own classroom for the first time in in, in early 2004. Uh, I I tried to my, my if I if I could boil my uh, my teaching philosophy really down to one sentence was basically to make sure that my students do not repeat the very same mistakes I made. They're more than welcome to go ahead and yeah. do you know figure out their own mistakes. Do do those those like, uh, no, 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 not ideologically, but like in my personal life, in my professional life, in my academic life, you know, avoid the uh, stuff like, you know, sticking it around on your phone or on an electronic game, on a video game for too long. Yeah. Text and, you know, call, um, you know, your significant other or your friends, just basically spending too much time on things that are not important or work too hard so much. You, you work so hard on your studies and work that you ignore the people in your life who matter. Yeah. Um, those are, that's really what my, my teaching philosophy is. And, and, you know, and, and the final analysis, I always, I always try to, and I tell this to my students as well as to my niece and nephew that, you know, I'm always going to be tough on you, but that's the reason why, because I often see people making the very same silly, simple mistakes that I made. And I just don't want them to, to I don't want to see my students uh, do that. They're more than welcome to go off and try something else, you know, yeah. uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, bust uh, bust their Achilles tendon while they were trying to run a marathon. I never attempted that, but you know, I would have great respect for a student who fails on that front, but then gets up and then tries again once their Achilles heel, uh, tendon uh, heals, of course. So that's 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 where I'm trying to go with. And you know, any any platform, be it social media, uh, office hours, classroom, where I get an opportunity to do that, um, I take that. I I take a chance, but. That's also now that's the, coming to the flip side. When I don't see the students basically buying into that, I really react very, very harshly. And that's still something I, I need to work on because sometimes I really come Maybe up across as abrasive. Like you know. Maybe not, but I think I can tamper down the, the sort of, you know, hey, what are you doing? Put that phone down the thing just a little bit. Um, you know, sometimes when I see students like hanging out on their phone, even in class, like, I don't care if you. Like I, I don't, I don't care if you, if you really learn, you know, the, yeah. the modern history of the modern world very well, and I'm a firm believer that you know, if something is really be, like, forcefully taught on you, at you, you're forced to take the class. It's a matter of you're not going to learn it. I mean, I, I ended up learning a lot more on my own uh, than than I did in. Uh, in the classroom before graduate school, before graduate school, I should, I should, I should put a caveat there. I should put what do you think a there. really good way is to reach students? Because not all of those students want to be in your classes. But what's been most effective for you so far? Well, uh, sending personal notes uh, via email or trying to one. Uh, so that that would be the, the first. Since we live in the electronic age, you know, reaching out to them via electronics is one way. I find that you know, I, I give students a nudge. Every yeah. time I, I send a personalized note to a student, like, I can see that you're going through something tough. And I know that's the reason why you're napping in my class. It infuriates me that you're napping in my class, but you got to ask for help. You got to go out there and seek help. And, and that, that works out a lot. When a student comes in into office hours, you know, uh, if, especially if they come with, with a purpose. One of the things that still gets me is, you know, they come completely clueless. I want them to, to take the initiative and be brave and, you know, to not worry about authority. But in order for them to do that, in order for them to gain that self-confidence, they yeah. really have to come into, on to the table, the metaphorical table, well yeah. prepared. And that's, 
That's true. I didn't feel myself well prepared until I was about 32, 33. But in, in terms of all of the things I did, you know, whether it was public speaking, whether it was my writing, whether it was, um, you know, um, like conference prep, business meeting prep, all of those things. And I want, I don't want my students to basically, again, realize that by the time they're in their early 30s, I want them to, to, to handle all of that by the time they're in their mid-20s. So you want them to carry their own weight by now? <laughs> punch their weight, exact punch at their weight scale and, you know, put, uh, put more weight on the scale to improve themselves, to build themselves uh, and, and to reach uh, greater heights. I mean, my, my father was actually also trained as a, as a, as a teacher in, in college. Nice. Um, in the, in the, in the sixties and seventies in Turkey, you could do that, you know, you could <laughs> like get a college degree and then, you know, public service is basically at your feet. And because he, he spoke, uh, he spoke English pretty well, you know, he ended up being in the foreign service. Um, but, uh, he said that, uh, on a, on a, on a personal note that, that, you know, you as my son, he, mm -hmm. he said, need to surpass me in everything I do. Yeah, I think if you don't, wants. society does not improve. You know, you on a personal, on a on, on your personal level, have a greater have a responsibility to, to me, to your mother, to your brother, to make yourself better than I. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you know, future generations need to strive surpass to surpass you. And 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 so that personal note has also influenced uh, my teaching. But it really starts with, you know, don't do the things, don't do the dumb things I did. I see. Um, yeah, yeah. Or at least learn not to do them way sooner than I did, so that you can get ahead. Learn soon. And the dumb things that you did uh, are much more likely to be effective for the students that we have now, rather than the much older professors, you know, with respect. Because, and I see that in younger professors, younger instructors, they tend to, you know, have had, they, they be able, they're, they're more, more able to relate to students on a more personal level, not only because of, you know, the fact that they're closer in age or closer in interests, but the sort of problems that they may have faced as a, at a younger age would have been a lot more likely to be relatable. For example, you mentioned video games. Yes. You said at a young age, you were into video games. I was addicted to them. <laughs> right. And now, you know, video games are still, still exist, maybe not in the age of some of the older professors, but still. No, that, that's uh, I am the first generation that basically uh, grew up on it, uh, grew up on video games and, and sort of the first video game addicted uh, generation in, in humanity's history, starting with the, you know, th small sort of Atari stuff and then the handheld devices. Um, but, but the games have only gotten better. They have gotten only more exactly. interesting. They're, they've gotten more play? exciting. Now there's you can play it with people, with billions of people from around the world. That's it's right. pretty dangerous, and I completely relate to that. Yeah. Uh, and you know, to to go back to the question that you asked earlier, you know, how do you relate? How do you reach out to a student? You really got to ask the students to do that. It's one of the ways sure. I feel I feel you know what works and what doesn't. I think they would be the best uh, judge of that. And and I I often try to put and I often fail in doing this is to try to put myself in their shoes and to try to remind myself of my own personal history. But it goes back again to what I said about few things infuriating me more than the people I love, younger people I love, repeating my mistakes. You know, one of the people who always gets this, who always gets a tongue lashing from me is my nephew, who is addicted to okay. uh, video games, you know, <laughs> wonderful lad, you know, beautiful boy, brilliant, but he's on the damn thing as soon as he comes back from school. And, you, you know, it, it takes really a gargantuan effort That's right. to get his mind off of something else. Um, and so I think there's a, there's, there, there, there's, sort of, there, there's definitely a merit, uh, in, in what you just said, Shad. Um, there are of course a lot of professors who can still relate because, of uh, of who are probably more, more senior than I yeah, am emotional intelligence. because yeah. many of them actually have uh, been a parent, which I haven't, which I would right. consider right. my greatest weakness as a teacher, because I don't know that that sort of, you know, because yeah. I, I never, I never tried to negotiate with a very, very tiny person <laughs> like when they were, you know, three weeks young, when they were six months old, when they were two and three, and then when they were five or ten or fifteen and and yeah. twenty. Uh, I keep asking my 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 uh, well now my my mother because my dad's gone, but my my brother. I'm like, why did you guys just sell me off as like scrap meat when I was a <laughs> like I, I must have been so much stuff because I now remember some of the stuff. Now, mm -hmm. now as a grown-up adult, I see it from a grown-up. I'm like, like oh my god! Like, 
like just you know sh- like blow him out of a cannon like experiment <laughs> on that guy yeah. you know like well we loved you but since i never had that maybe that's a big we- weakness i have that a lot of my um uh, more senior colleagues certainly have over me so they can approach you guys with a lot more patience yeah uh, uh than i do um so there's there's also that yeah i want to talk about sorry um, i want to talk about uh you know what what distinguishes you as a person especially uh in difference to the other people that we've had on or the other people that we that, that instruct us at AUIS is the fact that you've got a phd like that you no no i i know no, I, but but i'm talking about as an achievement I agree, and I've spoke to Fritz about this as well, is that anyone can have a, not anyone can have a PhD, but a lot of people can have a PhD in their uh, achievement and be, you know, you know, and not be as intellectual as you may have assumed with the, with what they had before their name. But I want to ask you, and you can touch on that as well. Uh, do you, what did you, did you always have this as a goal in your life to have a PhD, especially considering that you done military service and you grew up in Turkey and you had to do this in Virginia, which was way far from home. How did your parents receive this? And was this always a goal from a younger age? Or did you acquire it at, at an older age? Well, I was, I was, as I said, I was about your age, slightly younger than you guys when I decided I wanted to try my hand in academia. Uh, uh, that being said, I did go back and forth on it um, several times in graduate school. Um, around the time I, I had struggles finishing my dissertation, for example, I picked a very tough topic and I was writing it with a notoriously uh, tough uh, doctoral advisor who, was, who, who became like a father to me during this process, but he was very tough. Yeah. Uh, again, and maybe that's, again, you know, passing it on, I mentioned my, my own f- uh, father, yeah. a, another tough guy, son heard some of the stories uh, on the way here. <laughs> um, but my, 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 my doctoral advisor uh, at, at UVA, uh, Mr. Mel Leffler, um, he, he, you know, he would, he would be extremely flexible on certain things, but on certain matters of principle, you know, he was tough as nails. He would not ex- accept any type of ex- uh, uh, experience in uh, excuse in in any way um so i'm so I, I, to to answer your question of how i i got to the phd was basically the, the story i said earlier about well i want to be like that professor but if that person can get a phd i can do this job too right. sort of a mix of this so you know like, it's, it's, it's exactly ascribing desi- aspiring to become something greater but also saying that look if that guy can do it then i definitely need to sort of clean up this sector and uh, as well how much of it was your passion for world politics uh and world politics? honestly i got into it because of my father's job uh so uh-huh. young I, I i honestly wouldn't tell you couldn't tell you you were like a- from a genealogical um, if you want to, you know, use the Inception analogy, the 2010 uh, Christopher Nolan uh, movie, yeah, well, it's Christopher Nolan, right? When it it got Im- Im- implanted into my head, it's I've been I've been into it for such from such a young age that I can't I can't really tell you that this was the spot. It probably would have been, however, you know, starting primary school mm-hmm. in 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 Baghdad, knowing that you're in in a country that's not yours. In the middle of the Iran-Iraq war, by the way, this was the wow. phase of the war of the cities, up. you know, uh, of, 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 you know, missile attacks uh, reciprocally between the two sides. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, years later, sort of reading up on it and then understanding like some of the stuff that mom and dad were, you know, talking under their breath, sort of whispering and, you know, like words like halabja and, you know, chemical weapons mm-hmm. and, you know, you know, Foul Peninsula, Karbala 7 things like that uh and, and then you know my mother's uh, uncle uh, lived in kuwait we actually took a land route to visit him for a week so seeing kuwait and then in when we returned to turkey in 1988 two years later kuwait happens you know saddam decides to invade. like all of that you you basically have a, have a personal connection to it so yeah. i think that's what i got into it that's what got me into it uh, um, it almost chose me rather than uh, um, my choosing, choosing you know, studying right. history and h- right. history and politics. It's like life chose you. <laughs> <laughs> at, at one life, uh, at, at one level, yes, but on, on, a, on another level, I did veer off. I did get out of the reservation uh, too. You know, I finished my doctorate in 2014, and even before I finished my doctorate, you know, I did dabble in in public commentary. I did dabble in consultancy. I went to Afghanistan, which had nothing to do with my doctoral mm-hmm. uh, dissertation topic. 
um, in, 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 in Washington, I, I dealt with, uh, you know, with uh, consultancy stuff, corporate stuff, you know, boosting trade ties between Turkey and the United States, wow. things of that sort. <coughs> Excuse me. Which did have a bit to do with so, the association. It did, but it was really a tangential stuff. I mean, what enabled me while I was writing the dissertation, I basically became a self-read political economist, which I still refer to myself every now and then when I, when I have an idea to sell <laughs> to the private sector. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I really am not a political economist, but you know, I understand how, you know, the discussions that we have in the policy sphere affects pocketbook issues, bread and yeah. butter issues, you know, the, your, your shopping carts, uh, and sure. what you pay in the, in the checkout line. Mm -hmm. Um, but also macroeconomic, uh, you know, macro level stuff like, you know, how is the price of oil and gas going to affect the economy yeah. of this part of the world for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years? Um, which, which again, uh, enabled me to, to get into that. And ultimately, uh, uh, I, ended up someone, uh, I ended up being someone who likes to do a lot of stuff. And so I think that's, uh, that, that also is some so, something that, that appeals to students. Like, you know, who the hell is this guy? You know, talk, you know trash talking DC. Like, and then just constantly in the life. While in a course that's on, you know, the political Civ economy of Petrozo, yeah. or Civ 102, <laughs> or Civ 204. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I guess that's uh, that's a very long-winded answer to a very straightforward question, but that's awesome. that's the one as well. Something that interests me about you is uh, you're from Turkey, and you've been going back and forth a lot between uh, Kurdistan and just going back to Turkey every time, right? And I'm curious on how if it's made your life more difficult traveling back sometimes because you come to this region a lot, and there's obviously a conflict. Ah. Uh, Yes and no. I mean, it has an effect. I mean, first of all, on a, on a personal note, none of the stuff that, uh, that you see, um, you know, like I would argue probably without starting a huge controversy saying that my country has not been doing so well in the past five, six years. Uh, but in the U.S., I've been very critical. I was critical even before all of that start, stuff started. You know, the 2013 um, uh, Giza Park protests started. I was already, you know, sounding the tosins as early as the... We had a very critical turning point in, in, in these referend in this referendum in 2010, yeah. which enabled the party uh, that had a majority in parliament to basically get its hands on the bureaucracy as well as the judiciary. You know, yeah. Turkish judiciary had been sort of semi-independent uh, yeah. for much of its career, even though it, it had a very good working relation with which whatever party was in power. Um, and often they also relied on on the you know security services and the armed forces uh, to and often did their bidding in the in the legal sector. Um, but I, I said that it was it was always dangerous to for one faction in politics, even though they were close to fifty percent of yeah. the uh, they had close to fifty percent of the support of the citizenry to control you know the parliament and the bureaucracy and the judiciary and then the sort of, and so and then the rest is history. Um, but I went back and forth uh, when I lived in the States to, to back home to Turkey. Yeah. Nothing happened in 2014. You know, no cop asked me a question. I wasn't called in for questioning. Okay. Uh, since I got the job here in 2016, since I started working here in 2016. Do you usually visit so, Turkey or do you usually visit US? I go to the US since I came back on a, at an average of about once a year, but to Turkey I go back several times a year. And Are I'm you scared they're not going to let you back in one, one of these times? Um, I'm not so scared. I am concerned, but there's yeah. no stopping. There's, if, if someone decides to give, make my life miserable, there's in Ankara or in Washington or some yeah. other capital around the world, or Erbil or yeah. here in, in Suli or in Baghdad. No, I, I can't stop them. You know, there's, there's I'm asking one. because of the kind of commentary you do. That's yeah. why, you know, you have interesting, uh, you know, topics that you talk oh about. Oh, God, you're going to bring it up? Yeah. Oh, please, gonna, do, please, please do. Please do. Everything is fair game. I told no, you I did my homework I and saw, on your website. I saw this interesting topic you talked about. It was this protest, these, these feminist protests. Mm -hmm. uh, Feminine, I think. Go, go all called? the way back there. Yeah, I think I wrote that in the fall of 20... 13? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, you Not, dug deep. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I especially liked it because of, uh, 
the result you thought it may have on you know Turkey because uh, I, I think you can tell it better after I do but well, it was basically uh, women going out nude on the streets uh, uh, protesting Femen, uh, F E M E N yeah, uh, is the name right. of uh, of a sort of anarchist feminist uh, collective in Europe I mm -hmm. don't I think they're they don't have much of a presence in the Western Hemisphere okay. well anywhere outside Europe really. I, I think they tried to open a branch uh, in Istanbul. I think what that that article was about it was yeah. maybe around September of October 2013. I wrote it, um, and, and they're 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 very famous because these are uh, most of its. I don't know their status now. I haven't been following them uh, that closely. I think they got their start in. Uh, you guys got to fill me in because uh, I don't know when the last uh, European Cup, the, the one that was held jointly uh, between Ukraine and Poland, that's where they first started that group. Might have been 2012? Was it? Maybe. Uh, but I, it may have been earlier. Uh, maybe it was, it can't be 2008, that was in Germany. So it, 2012, then it would be, it would be 2012 yeah, then, right? 2012, yeah, the, yeah. the one in Poland, the Ukraine, yeah. So apparently these, these women started off as a sort of anti-prostitution uh, anti activists, yeah. uh, you know, fearing that the, 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 all of the like moneyed Western tourists coming in for the World Cup are mm -hmm. basically going to turn uh, their country into an open or brothel. Very legitimate concern. Fair enough. But, uh, you know, so uh, uh, but being anarchists, you know, and the, the, with having this, this, this desire to sort of, you know, uh, uh, basically tear every social institution uh, to the grounds, you know, they started attacking, you know, like uh, church symbols and, you know, going around like semi-naked, basically topless, which, yeah. of course, for for us lads, you know, who's <laughs> protesting, you know? Uh, semi-naked yeah. Ukrainian women, I'm not going to complain. But, uh, but but then, you know, they so, but these women, because of the political situation in, in Ukraine, um, mm -hmm. they quickly got backlash. And this is around the time when the, the, the Russian... Uh, when the, the, the Russian uh, musical group protested Putin. Right. And then all of these folks had to, the, these Ukrainian uh, ladies had to uh, f uh, seek refuge in France. And then from France, they spread to the rest of Europe, again, protesting, you know, Putin especially, yeah. uh, uh, and, and, and other, you know, um, prominent political and social, uh, socially prominent people. Uh, but then they, they, in 2013, you know, they, they sort of tried to reach out to Turkey. And I said that, look, one of the things, for example, that that the, that the Feynman organization, and I don't know, I, I really haven't looked them up in, in a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, and look up can be used here in many different ways. <laughs> but one of the things apparently they were doing for fundraising was that um, that the that these ladies, you know, they would have their uh, upper body uh, cast, and then you know they would they would literally like paint their upper body and right. then press their body on some on some canvas and then sell that as art, which is a, on the one hand, a brilliant idea. On the other hand, you know, if we're going to complain about the objectification of women, <laughs> I would say that that, that kind of, I think that was the point of, of that article. Yeah. It kind of, you know, yeah. I, I, I felt that there was a certain cognitive dissonance there. And, but that article itself was pretty problematic. I don't write articles like that yeah. anymore. Like just only thinking when I'm, just, I never reached out back then when I first started my commentary career. I never reached out to, to experts for, right for their comments, even though, you know, I, I took like two courses in women's studies or gender studies when I was in college. Right. I don't remember doing anything related to gender in graduate school, but you know, I, I, I'm someone who has a, who has a, you know, an outlook on, on that front, but I felt that it was, it was, I wouldn't want to say hypocritical, but you know, something, an approach that was laden with great cognitive dissonance. And that was my yeah. problem with, with Feynman that, you know, on the one hand you're telling men to stop objectifying women's bodies yes i agree but then you literally start raising funds yeah it was and very so, like so. i understand the intentions they were going for but what i found interesting is what like you said there's a huge barrier between the like let's say the guys and the girls like the guys are just gonna be like we have some uh titty paintings right now like after the protest they're not gonna be like there's a movement going on they're just happy to see some naked women on the streets i don't know if and this is... that can be just distracting yeah. There, was a, uh, there was a great uh, one of the one of them protested uh, Putin at some meeting he was ha he was going to have with Angela Merkel with the German yeah. Chancellor and um, this uh, fake uh, this Putin parody account on Twitter mm -hmm. uh, Darth Putin KGB I think for a while had his picture in the header as right. as that moment like Putin <laughs> sees one of these ladies and goes. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> with sort of Merkel looking on to him and, and right. the lady and you know the 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 guards rushing to the to the <laughs> situations and stuff. But you know Putin was like, yeah, very good. <laughs> so funny. it's uh, I, I think that 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 picture really sums up the, your your you know your straight guy's attitude uh, on these things. Like that's true. I'm not going to protest. Like you know, it was, you know that's. Uh, but then you you have to ask yourself as as famine or as a as an anarchist feminist actor whether you're really trying to achieve the the results that you're that you're seeking. That's true. What are your like takes on? So uh, when you're looking at modern day politics and the modern generations, you know, uh, take on extreme extremist leftist or extremist right wing thoughts. Tell me some of the things that you know liberals. That they, they think of, or maybe even the right wing guys, uh, the new generation is in particular, that really touches your buttons and not that button, maybe that button, whatever makes you angry. That's the heart. Um, yeah, that's the heart. And you know, <laughs> Iron Man 3, he actually had it uh, removed from his body. That, that simply became so, uh, just uh, the. Um, we'll get to uh, Marvel. The, the, mine, the mini Definitely arc reactor for a suit to power his, uh, Tony Stark's suits. Um, as someone who considers himself the center of the center um, <laughs> politically such a professor thing to say um, <laughs> no i mean i would say i'm a radical centrist uh, but it, a <laughs> lot of it uh, here's the thing extremists and radical are not are not synonymous we use them synonymously but right. radical in terms of its um, in, in terms of its original meaning meant basically someone who reached the roots uh, of when they were trying to you know append a poisonous plant or a herb uh, yeah. from a field. That was a radical because, you know, it comes from, I don't know the Latin word, but it comes from the word for root. Right. So you're really trying to get into the roots of the problem. But, you know, your solution may be just something very straightforward and not something that's going to completely upend, say, property relations or gender relations or sexual relations in a society. So you can be radical, but you're solution could still be extremely conservative you, you're right. not trying to change fundamental relationships in a, in a society an sure. extremist right. sure. is someone who who will but go both for the roots uh, but also you know destroy the entire field do you think field, yeah, you protect so. yourself from being ideological as well I, so i wouldn't say i'm not ideological therefore i yeah. would I, I i think uh during suli forum when uh you, when when we yeah. were uh talking um, for your um, Instagram feed, um, I, I said something to the effect of I'm a libertarian social democrat or a social democrat libertarian. I'm libertarian in the sense that I don't believe that governments should really get their hands on everything in people's lives, should try to interfere everything in people's lives, try to legislate everything. On the other hand, I'm also perfectly aware that, you know, Individuals cannot often help themselves. They often mm -hmm. actually are very bad at helping themselves, you know, raising themselves from their bootstraps, things of that sort. And I do believe that, you know, um, uh, that the, the best way to organize some of the basic sectors in society, like education, like healthcare, like um, social security retirement, uh, should come from either government action or government mm -hmm. regulation. Uh, so that's the that's the. Uh, uh, that's the uh, social democrat part, and then of course you can add things like you know the law and the court system and, and the environmental protection and things of that sort. Uh, so I'm I'm definitely ideological. I definitely take a stand on these issues. I would never say that I'm I'm you know I'm you know, this is beyond me. I'm a know nothing. Quite the opposite. I mean I, I didn't I didn't seek a, 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 a doctorate to go back to you to to, to, to build on your uh, earlier question. I didn't seek a. Uh, a, a doctorate in political history to, to be non-ideological. No, quite, quite the contrary. But I think to answer your previous question, why um, young people are so attracted to the extremes these days is a centrists like me have to have to be honest. The center has collapsed, uh, or it is collapsing, or it has failed to fulfill the promises that it gave to the people of the world uh, after the collapse of the Cold War, after the collapse of communism. You know, we said um, U.S. President Richard Nixon in the uh, in the early 70s said we're all Keynesians now. He was referring to the ideas of uh, John high Maynard taxes. Keynes of slightly high, t t well, somewhat high taxes, but really uh, government's uh, intervention in the monetary system to ensure, you know, uh, rapid economic growth. Uh, but also full employment. So for someone as conservative as Richard Nixon to say we're all Keynesian yeah. uh, was was unbelievable. But fast forward 20 years, everyone basically became a third wayer 
of the sort that you know you guys had in Britain under Tony Blair and they had in, uh, under Bill Clinton in the mm -hmm. United States. You know, uh, have the government uh, you know um, extend you know some social uh, guarantees to the citizenry, but for basically everything else, give a free reign to free market actors, and then you know let freedom, let wealth, let prosperity ring around the world. You know, globalization is when it, is, it was in the 1990s when globalization, for example, became a household yeah. word and uh, generate wealth all across the world. That actually didn't happen. It, or it did across the world, mm -hmm. but uh, the wealth and incomes have not been distributed equally and governments have been really bad all throughout the board, all, all, all across the board, with certain, with certain exceptions, have been pretty bad about you know, um, lifting people who have been left behind. You know, it's, for example, if I will tell you that, mm -hmm. if, you know, if I will utter the words Donald Trump, I think you will know exactly where I'm going to go with this. You know, it's very easy to cast Trump's supporters yeah. as, you know, a bunch of racist, idiotic, ignorant bigots. And as a very, as a very seriously anti-Trump person, I will tell you that's the wrong approach. A lot of these folks have been frustrated uh, because, you know, they have been promised heaven on earth and they have not. Uh, been uh, delivered that promise, and That's you true. see that all across all across the world with people who have been uh, who, who find purpose in life in extremist ideologies because uh, the center and uh, you know this gospel of secular you know uh, secular entertainment wealth prosperity shtick I don't know how to call it honestly. <laughs> I don't have a word for it I don't have a phrase I don't think for there it. is a word but I don't think but well, whatever this stuff all of this is just not giving enough or maybe this is one of the things that gives people meaning you know the the, yeah. the, the superhero them this mm -hmm. this this belief that there are really people out there uh, who uh, even if they're fictional who can inspire us um uh, uh, to to be a better version of ourselves, or you know, get our minds off things for a couple of weeks uh, each year, um, is 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 good enough. And then, is that how you want to transition into talking about your favorite superhero? No, 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 not at all. As I said, it's your show. You, you tell me what you want to. Well, I do want to ask one thing, thing before we get. I have into something. And, on my, so no, ask me, same, AMA yeah. guys, it's an AMA. Treat it yeah. like Reddit and this. No, we got AMA. plenty of time. You know, the, another interesting thing uh, from where you come from is the fact that you're Turkish. And that you're living here in Slimani, which, uh, in comparison to Erbil, is a is a, is a lot more you know anti-Turkish government, and you know you you tend to be on the side of anti-Turkish government, at least the AKP. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong for now. I think you're on the right track. Okay, um, now tell me in terms of let's be honest here. A lot of people will you know say the contrary, but if. Kurdistan or the Kurdish region is to succeed and thrive. We are, we do have to have good ties with people who are happen to be our neighbors, who have access to a geographic location that will be pivotal for our economy and for politics in general. Now, how do you think the KRG is dealing with that right now? You do, you deal a lot with American and Turkish ties. That's what your PhD is mm -hmm. on. Tell me how the ties are from what you've heard. Because at the end of the day, a lot of Kurdish news isn't Kurdish. You know, you may not be, you know, uh, as well equipped to that as uh, many Because others. I don't know Sarani Kurdish. Right. Um, or read it. So tell me, from what you know right now, do you think that there's, uh, we should be optimistic on that level or not really? Um, we should always be realistic. Um, the optimism or the pessimism uh, goes with the territory. Um to start with uh, something I wanted to say to your earlier question, Son, and then uh, to answer your question fully. So I, I do get some flack every now and then whenever I use the word Kurdistan in my public commentary, okay. especially in, 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 when, when commenting in my native Turkish, but even when I write in English. So there, there's always the, uh, you know, well, where is Kurdistan? It's not on a map. And, you know, yeah, that's get the in into that yeah. whole silliness with Google Maps uh, from <laughs> a couple of uh, months ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I would always very patiently, unless the person's you know just trolling me, I would always start by explaining. Well, you know, open up the Constitution of Iraq. It's mentioned yeah. five times. Go to a political map of Iran. It's like you know, there's literally a, a, a province called Kurdistan. So there you go. That's your first yeah, answer. There is, yeah. Um, so that's that's actually the usually the first hurdle I need to cross before I can actually even go into that. <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm serious. Um, 
of course, there are a couple of things now to, to take the sort of uh, long range, uh, long range view, the long term view. You know, Mr. Masoud Barzani himself actually said something uh, to this effect. I think he, when he visited uh, Turkey as the KRG president, I think it was for the first time in, in 2013 when he saw that the Kurdistan flag was hoisted alongside the Turkish flag. Right. And he said, you know, now that I see that, that, the, that the Turks have accepted the Kurdistan flag, I don't have to worry about our future as a people. Whether we become independent or not, you know, that's a different story, but, you know, at least we're, 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 we're safe as a people, you know. Yeah. Um, but relations have taken a big hit uh, as a result of the independence referendum. And, you know, there's some, uh, the, 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 and, and you can, you know, distribute the blame uh, perhaps we can disagree on which who's going to get a bigger portion of it or, or not. But I think both sides, both uh, Kurdistan uh, uh, authorities, but also uh, my government played their hands uh, pretty uh, poorly. I think there has been, from what I've heard from within the bureaucracy in, in, in Ankara, that there was a sense that while uh, the, uh, the higher ups were trying to sort of you know, cool down mm -hmm. uh, the, in the run up to the independence referendum, you know, um, to, to sort of put insert some more realism into Mr. Barzani's hopes. I think um, a lot more uh, uh, Kurdish politicians with the governing AKP uh, were underhandedly giving more encouragement uh, to Mr. Barzani, wow. giving him a sort of, giving him a, well, we would be okay if go you guys it. ultimately go for it. Go for it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, it was really, you know, we got to we got to go back a year and a half ago. That was really in the weeks, maybe ten or twelve days before the the referendum was up, when you know the Turkish military had those joint uh, exercises right in that in that uh, uh, in the um, in the in that sort of uh, Silopi triangle, you know, that where uh, that that, that the, the Turkish border sort of goes just literally just very little like this okay. if you look at the map into. Uh, into um, Kurdistan, right by the uh, Ibrahim Khalil uh, border crossing, uh, Kabul crossing. Okay. Uh, they had joint patrols, joint exercises there. Yeah. That's when, you know, I think uh, the KRG understood that Turkey was not going to fall behind this. But a lot of that had to do with Turkey's own internal politics. Mm -hmm. Because uh, in 2015, 2016, President Erdogan found himself much more beholden to the ultra nationalist uh, nationalist action party MHP, so okay. then all bets were off. You know, AKP, which which really started this process of you know the word Kurd or you know Kurdish not being taboo subjects or even using the word Kurdistan in public. It was Erdogan himself who actually uh, you know tried to coach people in public okay. that you know don't worry about this word Kurdistan. You know, our ancestors, our Ottoman ancestors, used to. Use it as a geographical destination, as a as a as a you know, uh, as both a place but also a people. So be cool with it and just you know, uh, move on. But now because he's with MHP, okay. MHP is his coalition partner. Yeah, he's really gone back to uh, he's really gone back on that. So to answer your question, am I optimistic? I'm realistic. I think relations will remain normal. They will remain you know, um, steady, but I don't think for for the foreseeable future that unless Turkey can, you know, take some, make some, take some steps in normalizing and cooling down its own Kurdish, Kurdistan slash PKK problem, because all of those are intertwined. They are separate, but, you know, they are very much jumbled problems that are jumbled together. And unless the whole problem can be cooled down, mm -hmm. Um, it's uh, it, 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 Turkey KRG relations will not. I don't see, you know, get yeah. get way way better that you know trade fosters further and you know we can find scholarships for you guys to go to Turkish uh, universities and like, you know, Turkish government offering hundreds and hundreds of scholarships to Kurdistani students every year. That that may not happen uh, for the foreseeable future. And, and something like that would also happen within the context of. Uh, uh, of Iraq uh, writ large, and that's a good thing. But you know, general improvement has to. Uh, it takes a lot. You know, uh, it's going to take a lot uh, for the relations to. Improve. You know, how the oil dispute is going to be settled between Erbil and Baghdad, and how the case against uh, Turkey uh, that the Iraqi government brought mm -hmm. uh, for uh, buying oil from Kurdistan 
is going to be settled, and it is going to be settled at, at Turkey's to Turkey's disadvantage. But you know how bad it's going to be, what the price tag is going to be, and how Turkey is going to try to weasel itself out of that. So much rides on so many of those technical stuff um, rides on. I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm so that. It, you can't hear me, but I was <laughs> yeah. just, just resting my cheeks. It. It's, it's, like, it's, there's yeah, so much to go by. Turkey's, as I said, own domestic uh, politics. Whether Erdogan uh, can find another coalition partner be beside the MHP, or you know, MHP tries to use the rising tide of Turkish nationalism in a way that it can, you know, um, sort of find a much bigger space for itself in, Tur in the Turkish party. And that I don't know. That a lot rides on on that. It's a yeah. very good question, but I'm not the person with the answer. Yeah. I don't think anyone does. On the same note of that, uh, there's this uh, kind of movement in Kurdistan that where, you know, they're trying to boycott Turkish products as like a way to retaliate against, you know, all the things that uh, Turks, you know, have against Kurds. And f one, one, one of the kind of boycotting that I'm interested in is Kurds traveling to Turkey for tourism, because that's mm -hmm. one of the one nearest uh, places for Kurds to travel and also we don't need uh visas and stuff like that to mm -hmm. get there but uh do you think it affects uh do you think you know people like me people like my siblings and my friends should be able should be obligated to take a stance on uh traveling to turkey like are we the part of like if i go to turkey is that going to change anything in terms of like politics or, or don't like, go or no don't go? I, and honestly i think in the greater scheme of things you know you shouldn't seek anyone's validation to do anything uh, in life besides perhaps your 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 parents and your your your, your siblings really yeah. those are the first people what i'm asking is is it some sort of like uh, false uh, moral compass that we have right now or is it valid is it valid to i, I mean if you feel that uh, if you if 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 an Iraqi Kurd feels that the only way to punish Turkey is through a boycott of that sort, they're more than welcome to try it. I don't mm -hmm. know. I haven't. I haven't seen the numbers uh, on on the five hundred dollars you spend there is not going to change that. Well, but if yes, but if a hundred thousand, uh, right. uh, you know, Iraqi Kurds decide mm -hmm. to do this, and yeah, that's that, that, that's going to be a lot of five hundred dollars. That's right. Um, and that would that would hurt uh, that would hurt the Turkish uh, tourism sector. Um, not buying for something like that. That's where I see. That's where I would put on the, the political economist hat, like okay. for that one time, uh, once or twice in a year. I, I would have to see the, the the numbers, and I really haven't looked into this. I've been meaning to write about this for a long time since yeah. literally the week of the independence referendum, uh, but I never got to it. Um, but I've always been under the opinion that Turkey should really not push Kurdistan or Kurdistani people that much because a you know. This really is, in the final analysis, an internal Iraqi matter. It's something that Erbil and Baghdad have to sort out. And I don't think, but again, that, that goes back to my sort of libertarian leanings, you know. Yeah. I, I, I have trouble, you know, I, I have trouble getting my municipality to fix, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the sewer canals in my street. And it's, one of the, it's in one of the best neighborhoods in Ankara, you know. It's literally yeah. uh, two streets down from the old presidential palace, you oh. know, Ataturk's home. Uh, from the 20s and 30s and and like for years I see this huge truck basically trying to you know fix that that, that problem every it's now there permanently you know it's bureaucracy basically there. baby it, it but on the other hand can I do this like jointly with like call in a private sector it's going to cost me a lot more um, so that's that's where the social democrat is going to because it costs a lot less pulling your resources together yeah. um, even for a wealthy neighborhood in in, in Ankara. So, uh, but, but, you know, and what is it my business to try to, to, to get into trying to fix uh, another country's problem? I mean, yeah. you, when, when you really blow that up, pun not intended, you, the result of interfering in your neighbor's business has brought us Syria, you know. Yeah. I don't think Turkey is the, the main actor to blame about Syria, but I think we do deserve a, a, a good chunk of the blame. I still think it's, you know, it's... it's this this is Assad and the, the the political structure of Syria that really blew up in the context of the Greater Arab Spring that that made Syria blow up the way it did. But we definitely, instead of you know, running to the problem with a big fire hose, we really ran to it with with petrol cans. And my government is is down the road. You know, Turkey itself is going to have to do some reckoning on that front. But you know, I don't think it's again, it's, I don't think it's Turkey's uh, business uh, to to tell. Iraqis, be they Kurds or, or 
or or something else to right. to to tell them to do. So, but if if someone like you or a peer of yours feels that you know they they want to punish Turkey on this front, yeah, they're more than welcome to boycott it. But honestly, to also be honest with you, I, I don't I don't see how every time I go to the market, I turn those like you know. It's you know the the the, the, the Turkish national he was saying to my it, it actually that was the first time when I got here but now I don't care like <laughs> half the stuff I I get my hands on in the stores here is Turkish and I honestly haven't You're seen Turkish. any any serious you know decrease in the availability of of Turkish products it Not really, really I think I think it's really uh, been modulated by the preferences of certain stores but by and large I haven't seen any decrease in the availability of Turkish products here since the fall. I think, yeah, that's part of the problem so. as well, because we don't take we forget to take blame for the part that, yes, we can remove the Turkish products from the bazaar and from the market, but uh, remove the Turkish products. Half of our malls are going to be empty. Half of the bazaar is going to be empty. And uh, nobody's willing to take uh, blame for that part of the, you know, the stance that they're willing for to. not diversifying the economy when oil prices were high in the 2000s and early 2010s. Exactly. Yeah. You know, why, why can't, you know, uh, Kurdistan or Iraq produce some of the stuff uh, that it, it probably could, you it's know, like canned fish. It's a good question. Canned fish. I don't know why canned fish. You know, you got a lot of fish. Which, huh? What do you mean canned fish? Canned fish. Like I, I fish know and like fish. Is, but <laughs> why'd you bring it up? <laughs> well, because it's one of the things I, I love about like products from home. My, one of my okay. things is canned tuna. I, right, I right, get it. Right. Like I, I'm almost fascistic, even though you know you have good products from UAE, from Jordan. I'm always like this one particular brand I, I like very much, and whenever I find it, I don't buy anything Which else. One but is like it, by that, because I'm a canned fish person as well. Uh, super fresh, I think. Okay. Uh, is the Do no, I, I get the I get the standard I, I get the vanilla. Not it, it doesn't have literal vanilla in it. Oh, it's no, in brine. Goodness. It's in brine. Yeah. No, no. God no. <laughs> Would be interesting though. Maybe I'll try a little, just a little bit of uh, if vanilla it came cream. From anywhere, probably come from Turkey as well. Well, uh, uh, yeah, maybe somewhere <laughs> in continental <laughs> Europe, um, Belgium, because those guys are came. No, not Belgium. Probably. Uh, who would do that? Greece? Austria. No, Greeks the, the Greeks are pretty conservative and they have very good palates, so I don't think they would do it. Um, Maybe Austria, they would mix stuff like ger the Germans, because <laughs> they like them. Maybe the Danes. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, consistent. Again, going back to cognitive dissonance, you know, yeah. if, on the one hand, Turks say that they don't have anything against Kurds, and that may on a personal level be true. Like, he may have Kurdish relatives, a person may have Kurdish friends, yeah. but then they would say absolutely the dumbest stuff about Kurds in Kurdistan and the, just to reveal their ignorance. So there's cognitive dissonance on my front, on my side, but there's also a lot of cognitive dissonance, you're right, on this side. You know, we're going to boycott Turkey and we're going to do this and that and blah, blah, blah. And OK, so next time you're going to visit your friends and family in Germany or Sweden, Enjoy the enjoy you know the in-flight entertainment on Turkish Airlines and the great food. So you know there's not you can only work with these things so much. Um, but I haven't seen that coming to fruition. So if, if people want to do that, all power to them. But yeah. I don't see it. If, if it hasn't happened in the last 18 months, I don't see how it's going to happen now. Yeah. In the last 20 months. So. so um Let's uh, get into the non-serious stuff that we want to talk about. No, no, no that's the decision. If you mean by non-serious stuff, this <laughs> no, is the serious, serious stuff. stuff. Yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. But let's get into more non-serious stuff. Um, we obviously we talked about this before, but like you know, we know that you're a big Marvel fan. Uh, and did you like the new Aquaman, by the way? Honestly, I I, I really suck about uh, on the DC front. That took me months uh, did you watch after it? though. I did not. I did oh, not watch Shazam cool. either. Good. I, I, I that, watched. By the way. A lot of clips from Justice League. Uh, I think that's how I maybe I did. I, I honestly can't because I can't, I just cannot, you know, compose myself and compose the attention. Uh, to, to I, I don't I, I don't watch DC uh, movies in yeah, the cinema. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I watch them on on the Turkish Airlines flight because Turkish <laughs> Airlines is more pro DC than 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 pro MCU. No, because you know they they sponsored. Uh, they were one okay. of the producers of uh, Batman v Superman. Right. Uh, you know there's it, you know there's that part where Wonder know. Woman walks out of a of a of a Turkish Airlines flight. And, you know, she gets hollered uh, by, by, by one of the flight attendants, you know, Miss so Prince, Miss Prince. And yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you just got to, but very I th they must have paid at least $10 million of the, of the $150 million production yeah. budget. <laughs> not, not exactly, a, you know, a yeah, chunk yeah. of change, maybe $20 million um, to get their brand up there. And it's smart. I just wish they had done it, 
you know, uh, in an MCU so, movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah. So I haven't seen Aquaman. So, I, remember, so I, I saw Wonder Woman on DigiTurk, Turkey's main, uh, you know, digi digital uh, uh, platform. Um, but, yeah. Not a big DC fan in general. But the Dark Honestly, Knight has to be out there. No, right, right, I mean, right. here's the thing. Everyone credits uh, Robert Downey Jr. for starting the, the, the MCU, and he's yeah. he, he deserves all the credits in the world, but it was really Christopher Nolan's 2005 Batman Begins, which really reinserted uh, superhero movies as a serious genre, that's as a true. genre that has, uh, as a movie genre that has important and serious things to say about uh, the serious matters in life, you know. The difference between justice and revenge, for example. That's yeah. true. Uh, the difference between what noblesse uh, oblige, noblesse oblige. Um, you know, what's the uh, what someone like Bruce Wayne, mm -hmm. you know, super rich guy, what responsibility he has towards his fellow man. Uh, what what does someone like Tony Stark uh, have to offer uh, to the world uh, besides you know blowing stuff to blow things up with? You know, a yeah. lot of those things. Christopher Nolan basically. Uh, handled and and you know when when Dark Knight Rises came out, of course, this was it came out right uh, right before the Occupy movement started in right. New York City, yeah, and yeah, you know yeah. a lot of people drew parallels between the movement that Bain was was leading in the Dark Knight Rises. All of these people who have been upset with with the Gotham's the governing L -L elites and the rich and the powerful yeah. and 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 their own plight and and the Occupy uh, Occupy Wall Street movement. So so. You're definitely, you're absolutely right. But I feel that after Man of Steel, uh, I think uh, once um, that 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 chap um, um, took the leadership, took command of the uh, of of directing, the, whose name now eludes me. I'm sorry. Um, who's the the Chris director? Not who after Christopher Nolan. So Christopher oh, I Nolan. Know, did, yeah. I, I didn't do too he well. did the he did the three hundred the, the movie three hundred. Oh, he did. Uh, oh, he okay. is the director of that. Some some guy. Yeah, please look it up. Um, I'm gonna say like Zach Fisher, but that's not it. It's like Zach, Zach Snyder. Zach Snyder. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's close. Even though he did Watchmen, and apparently there's a there's a cut of the movie Watchmen out there, mm -hmm. which really parodies the genre. Uh, the superhero genre, but still deals with serious issues in life. You know, jingo jingoism, ultranationalism, the use of American military might around the world, and then or the misuse of it. There, therefore, uh, thereof. Um, you know, but that then apparently the movie was sort of taken in another direction uh, by um, by by Warner Brothers, and the guy was really upset with them. But then he still came back um, uh, to to uh, to do. Um, the the, uh, the Justice League Justice movies, um, but I, I felt Man of Steel was pretty good. But after Batman v Superman, I lost interest. I thought Wonder Woman was good because my mother thought good. Wonder Woman was good. <laughs> she sort of liked the you know girl power joke. But okay. on the other hand, you don't really have to preach that message to my mother because until you know her mid fifties, until you know her her diabetes, her osteoporosis, her menopause kicked in. You know she was one of the physically strongest people I knew. Like Whoa. she was Wonder Woman. <laughs> yeah. was. Okay. So uh, no, I mean she could she could really even today I think she, if she was upset enough she could probably kick someone's butt, um, yeah, nice. any person of her choosing. But she's she's now you know she's now a nice little marshmallow grandmother because of my niece. And <laughs> That's nephew. sweet. Um, but you know so so I support that. On the other hand, I just don't see visually in terms of storytelling, in terms of even production quality. I just don't see it's, it's DC really. really yeah being a competition for Marvel or even like the side Marvel stuff that is now being brought into the MCU fold. You know, I'm talking about X-Men and, and Deadpool. Um, I just uh, I just don't see and, and Spider-Man actually came in through the back that way, too, through an arrangement with Sony and 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 uh, uh, and and Disney, because in the 90s, in the late 90s, Marvel basically farmed out through contracts uh, these characters to Sony, um, to Fox. The X Men uh, right. series, uh, the the X Men group to to Fox and Spider Man to Sony. But once MCU started doing as well as it did, especially once it was acquired by Disney, I think around 2010 or 2011, you know, DC, uh, um, MCU and 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 Disney really started taking uh, taking over. And I haven't seen Shazam. People say that it's it's it's, it's striking. It's, it's striking. It has struck the right tone. It struck the right note. Uh, 
Yeah. So maybe DC is going to is finally figured out a, a, a tone to to maybe be a competition of, of MCU, but I just don't see how that's going to happen People, for the next two, three, four years. You spoke about attention, uh, the attention that you don't have during DC movies. And like for mm. me, uh, when I was watching an Endgame and I, before the only other two, I watched like three other Marvel movies before watching Endgame. So I was not on par with him. He missed like in that 17 time. of the other yeah. movies. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, at about, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And so Even I, more. you'd think that I'd go in there. A person who walked out of Aquaman, by the way, I walked out of Aquaman, maybe because I didn't watch the ones before, but I didn't like it at all. I'm not a big superhero movie guy. But Endgame was brilliant. Like, I really, really liked it. Not for one second did I think of peeing. Did you I were of, being left out. Yeah, or left anything. Them. I didn't think of anything else. It, I was so, I was stuck to my seat and till the end, the end, the end was, ending was amazing. Um, but um, what did you think of it? And let me know, what did you think of how quick they, they came up with the whole time machine thing in the scheme of things? Which was my biggest critic. Oh, that's, really. that's, that's, that, that's a very well taken point um, okay, cool. of, uh, of, uh, of the role of time travel, but also how quickly the characters came up with it. Um, I guess the, 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 the retort to, to, to the criticism against time, uh, to time travel was, well, well, it had always been there. Uh, the second, in you know, you have the. In case anyone hasn't watched, this will have spoilers, by the way. So yeah. Okay, so I was going to ask you guys uh, if yeah, you want you spoilers or, or not. Okay, then heavy spoilers, you heavy spo know. Yeah, I mean, stop it, right here. I mean, you know, it's been a few weeks. Yeah. Though, I mean, check I the timestamp on the video below since it's going to be posted on YouTube. You know, go yeah, go yeah, on to yeah. something else. You know, but you guys maybe you want to add like heavy spoilers. Heavy spoilers <laughs> yeah. Don't worry if you haven't seen it. End, end game. Um, <laughs> Well, then again, the Russo brothers have lifted the embargo, so we're, we should be allowed to, to, yeah, to discuss sure. with, you know, um, <coughs> your, your viewers should be, or, or should be cautioned. Um, on, a, on the one hand, you know, that, that, that machine was devised during the second Ant-Man movie, Ant-Man and, right. and the Wasp. Um, and, and in fact, that was how, even in the uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp end credits, you know, you, you, we were given a pretty... Uh, a heavy yeah, dose of yeah uh, of foreshadowing about how Ant-Man and the Wasp was going to tie into the post Infinity right. War uh, uh, world, and all, all, the only thing that basically Tony Stark did was, and it wasn't just he did something very simple, which is to understand you know through using uh, 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 the principles of uh, of of quantum physics uh, of you know where by by manipulating. Uh, time you can also manipulate your your place in space essentially because you know that's the thing that you know oh by the way i came up with a gps because they had a gps they had a they had a, a geo positioning problem you know the when they're first trying the the time machine aspect of the of the quantum tunnel you know uh scott lang ant-man comes back as both his old self yeah, and as his baby, baby yeah. self and yeah. then as his own self Right. Uh, and then he makes a joke about you know someone peed in the suit and he doesn't know if it's his <laughs> no, old self, his baby self, or himself. Yeah. And that was a great one. And then you know Tony Stark drives in to the Avengers headquarters and says, "I know what your problem is, and I actually already fixed it thanks to um, I don't know if his AI in uh, in in, uh, in Endgame was Karen or Friday, but one of them helped him you know just basically run tests yeah. and 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 help him fix that problem." At least at a theoretical level. So it was a. I felt that that was since there was a lot of background to it. And but of course, if you haven't watched Ant Man yeah. and Ant Man and the Wasp, I just ruined that one for you. But <laughs> by the way, don't fret. If you're going to take this summer, really do do it. One of the greatest cultural investments I ever made in myself was about 10, 12 years ago. I started watching the James Bond series. Okay. Uh, all movies from well, one to at the time. So. Oh. Uh, I never got into it that much, okay, uh, cool. but maybe I will, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, heavy fans tell me that as, aside from the uh, original trilogy, there's really yeah. everything that has since come has uh, been, has been uh, pretty Arab. The, the old ones, but the old ones really like oh, of course. The from the late 70s. Yeah. The, the, yeah um, the ones with the, uh, Sir Alec Guinness. Um, yeah. uh, anything outside of that, you know, is, is just not that good. So, so James Bond? James Bond and and that so I would humbly advise you to basically go back to 2008 Iron Man Incredible Hulk actually even even watch uh, the 2003 or 2004 uh, Incredible or 2002 with Eric Bana playing uh, Hulk but that one was 
that one was really an attempt to see if the two th the one with Eric Bana playing uh, the Incredible Hulk has a lot of you know um, uh, um, sort of fan service, but but really comic book fan service, like because you know there's the Hulk smash and you know whenever there's a there's a battle, you know they actually have like balloons come up, like the way they would blow things oh, up in the right, comics, right. and apparently that was not at all well received by the audiences. And then once MCU started producing its movies in house. Incredible Hulk with Edward Norton playing um, uh, Bruce Banner Hulk uh, has a much more realistic feel. And it actually has uh, a, a post credit scene with uh, Tony Stark walking into a bar telling General La Ross, I told you so, this, these super soldier things just don't work. You know, your, mm -hmm. your gamma ray stuff, you know, your, ability, your, your attempts at manipulating DNA is just not going to work. So maybe why don't you you know bring me into your fold and and let me run point on some of these things for you then he walks out and of course then there's iron man 2 then there's captain america thor and of course then there's 2012 Who? avengers the first avengers yeah. movie and so was the best uh... watch all 21 of them <laughs> all 21 you. there's so many of you them. you amazing, need though. You need to watch all of them to make better sense of the whole universe. Yeah, because yeah. there's I, a chance that this thing is going to be remain culturally prominent for the next five true. years. You don't want to be left out of all of it's those conversations, do you? The business rapport that you make, yeah, it's, it's so yeah. big now. Yeah, the new yeah. Spider Man's amazing as well. Um, that looks so good. Right? That looks so good. But uh, favorite Incredible Hulk, the person who plays it. For, uh, best actor. Oh, Banner, Norton, and, and uh, Banner. Uh, I should first, uh, before I answer your question, give a uh, warning to your viewers that I actually never got into comics that much. So I never, I read a few, but never like, apparently there are literally like thousands of issues of these things. Of course. Hundreds of stories, storylines. Mm -hmm. um, I would feel that, I would, I felt that, um, I feel that, you know, uh, Mark Ruffalo has, has done a pretty good job with, think, with yeah. uh, the character. My my other thing is I'm coming into this very biased because while I respect both Eric Bana and Ed Norton as actors, I've always been a fan of you know uh, of our, of Mark Ruffalo's handling of complex characters. There's there was this movie he was in with Robert Redford and James Gandolfini called The Last Castle. It's set in a U.S. Uh, military penitentiary. Robert Redford playing a three-star general uh, who's been imprisoned in a court martial for not following direct orders by the president. It's set mm -hmm. uh, like the context is basically like post Rwandan genocide Burundi and you know, he doesn't follow orders. So men under his command dies right. uh, and then he's brought back home and he's tried and you know, he's stripped of his rank and he's thrown in the slammer. Okay. James Gandolfini is, 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 uh, is the, uh, is the full bird colonel. He's a full colonel and the warden of this prison and Robert Redford, who's been, you know, an officer all his life, you know, Vietnam War hero and, and whatnot is now trying to mix in with, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the frontline grunts who are in a U.S. military prison <laughs> a maximum security prison. So, you know, these guys have been done some absolutely horrible stuff. Exactly. And Mark Ruffalo is one of those go between guys. You know, he's a he's a bookie. You know, he keeps uh, he lets people gamble. You know, he's yeah. one of the guys who brings in contraband from outside. He snitches on his fellow inmates. So Mark Ruffalo was playing that guy. But it turns out in this story that Mark Ruffalo's father was one of the folks who were imprisoned along with Robert Redford's char wow. uh, character in the Hanoi Hilton, the, where, the place where Senator John McCain was after his plane was shot down <laughs> right. in the Vietnam War. So it adds, and Mark Ruffalo just handled that character just beautifully. So, uh, uh, very and very I've been a huge fan of his, he was in that movie with, um, was it with Reese Witherspoon? Like just like heaven or something. It's like a rom com, oh, but it I has like a like a metaphysical element to it because I think uh, she's there. But she's she's, she's there. like yeah, she's like a semi ghost. Like she's yeah. in. Thanks she's in. Sure. Uh, so. That's a good uh, movie. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what about the worst uh, Avenger actually? Worst Avenger? Yeah. Or, uh, or most useless? Sorry, that's. It's <laughs> gonna be the uh, wizard guy. Oh, Doctor Strange. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Dude, he's the most useful. I mean, not most useful. useful. Well, he, well, he did he see the future, and again, like spoilers. Six, yeah. Or at least it won't be spoilers for those of you uh, who have watched the movie. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, 
I really have to think. I'm, I, I have OCD. My students will, will, will tell me, will, will tell you this right up front. I'm, I'm very particular about, uh, about things I, I feel strongly about my teaching, how pa my students should write their papers, mm -hmm. how they should answer questions, which questions they should handle, what sort of sources they use. You really have to, let's come back to this question. Give me like, I'll, I'll throw this sure, to the back sure. of my mind. Okay. I'll let the, like the back computers process that one. The, 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 the Captain America theory. That you, you told me the other right. I think there's cool. yeah, there's a really interesting Captain America theory with you know how he went back in time to return the stone and you know set everything back in its place, but then everything he, except himself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it got delayed and he came back a bit after that. As old Mel Rogers. Yeah. yeah. So the theory is that he stayed there because he saw Natasha back in the past and he they both knew what was going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it, 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 clips, it cuts to a scene where Captain America is dancing with his old girlfriend, right? Uh, theory is, Carter, yeah, yes, they never got back together. He just went back for one dance and then he went along and uh, married Natasha. And that's who he lived happily ever after with. Why and couldn't he be with the girl? Though? He couldn't be with the girl uh, because he could not change the you know the time because the way yeah, time she is, is supposed to go off and marry some exactly. other guy. Well, there's a retort to that which said that you know um, there's a five there's like a three four minute clip which is actually on YouTube, and I think it comes from Winter Soldier or one of those things where uh, I think it is from Winter Soldier where uh, Peggy Carter is talking to for a documentary for the Smithsonian Institution okay. in Washington uh, she discusses that you know Captain America through saving all of those POWs in the first Avenger movie yeah uh, basic one of those captives was also her future husband right and some people say that well actually she was sort of doing a, a, a sort of you know a slate of hand because she would ultimately marry Captain America, that even in her timeline, Cap was gonna come back. But a lot of people say that that's actually not true. She does marry one of those other guys who joins her in S.H.I.E.L.D. and you know, some other, maybe a mm -hmm. British SOE guy or an MI6 guy or, or an, another American who works for Strategic uh, Reserve or OSS, the, the predecessor of, of the CIA. I don't know, but I, I you see, I didn't see that much chemistry between um, the Agent two? Natasha Ro Romanoff and uh, Steve Rogers to say that that they, they stay, stay together. together. Um, but if if Cap remains, if he decides that that he would, he, yeah. if he decides that he's going to leave Peggy and leave that timeline on its own, yeah. yeah. But on the other hand, a lot of people are saying that. Uh, that both with the wedding ring and you know with the last dance, a lot of people said that. Look, I think he just understands that there is going to be a timeline, a different timeline for him, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And you know he deserves a, he deserves a good retirement, and that's his that, you know a, a sort of enlightened self interest because you know. And when he came back, he never mentioned who he married. You know when they asked him, maybe they like, want to leave their chance, their options open. Maybe MCU I producers so. want to leave that. Maybe they want they will decide to go back on that. But yeah, because Captain America is not over, is it? Because he just got the hammer, or is it? Because he did get when he picked up the because hammer. he picked up the hammer. With the well. Yes, but he also returned the hammer to where Thor picked it up. Oh yeah, that's right. From the from the second Thor movie, Dark Worlds. That's mm -hmm. where Thor, our I timeline, twenty nineteen Thor, twenty twenty three Thor picked it up. Uh -huh. uh, uh, but then that's where Cap was supposed to return it on the day Thor's mother, Queen Frigga, uh, Freya Frigga, uh, uh, dies uh, in combat, in yeah. glorious in glorious combat. Um, <laughs> And, and then he returns uh, the uh, the Mjolnir, the hammer there, yeah. and then goes off into the next timeline, returns the other stone and the and the. Uh, um, it's very the complicated, but uh, yeah, like, yeah. Well, a lot of people are saying that he simply couldn't uh, save Natasha. A lot of people are saying that well, if Natasha could have been saved, then old Gamora from Infinity War, Gamora could have also been, been able to come now. back since there was the snap. That's true. Dr. Banner did the snap, but she didn't come back. Natasha mm -hmm. didn't come back. Yeah. And simply by depositing the Soul Stone back in the planet of Volmir to Red Skull. I don't think Red Skull was going to be impressed by saying, hey, <laughs> I, I return my, I'm going to return the Soul Stone. Can I get my friend back? <laughs> I don't think his answer is going to be high. I mean, nope. this, and Red Skull is someone who worked for the Nazis. So I don't <laughs> think that's true. So, yeah. So um, tell me, we had this conversation briefly before. Um, and I'm a big Joker fan, as in like the Joker. 
Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, and not a big Thanos fan. fan. Because mm. Thanos, um, you know how you have evil guys in movies mm-hmm. whose plans make practical sense, but it's evil, right? Yeah. I don't think Thanos is one of them. I think he's wrong on the practical side and he's one, uh, wrong on the the morality side, yeah. uh, you know, uh, from an objective st- standpoint. Well, Which one do you think is the more, no, not noble, I wouldn't say noble is a word, but, you know, better villain, at least. Well, I mean, no doubt about it. First of all, uh, the late Heath Ledger's interpretation of the Joker is all acting, you know, that's, that's, that's yeah. what, it has to be one of the best acting ever in the last, you know, 120 years For of, sure. of, sure. of, motion pictures so good that it cost a life right <laughs> well we don't know that. i mean apparently yeah, he had I mean, drug he had drug issues a lot and a lot of people say that he actually was pretty okay he looked okay uh, after the role and but there's another group of people who say that it probably opened up a darker side to him that yeah. he was never able to get out of i'm not a professional i don't i never <laughs> knew Heath ledger i don't know anyone who knew Heath ledger that's not my place to comment on that um but i would say that it's first of all it's way better acting and you're absolutely right that in terms of trying to get what i would say is that the joker fits as a villain into uh the nolan trilogy a lot better than uh thanos fit into the mcu so you're right about that in the sense that you know he he's only there for chaos he actually doesn't care about the end result as long as it creates chaos as long as to give spoilers from the dark knight you know the people in the in the ferry in the in the in the two ferries yeah. get to blow each other up you know the the ferry with the, with all of the inmates. the whole horrible inmates yeah. from uh from uh gotham prison or arkham asylum i think it was gotham yeah. prison and all of those innocent people and they all decide to not press the button it's a gr- it's a much better way of you know uh punishing uh, the bad guy yeah. also so the villain genuinely loses by not he being does. killed but on the other hand he also genuinely wins by as Batman says at the end as Bruce Wayne says at the end by turning Gotham's best yeah, into the, a villain by yeah, turning you know Harvey uh, Dent, Harvey Dent uh, to to all against all of his prison essentially to to, uh, to into um, f- into fulfilling his his destiny you know who, when because when harvey dent says at the beginning of the movie you know b- do you do you get to die a hero or do you live long enough uh, see to see yourself become a villain that's exactly what happens that's exactly what uh, happens. you know he turns out he's not the batman turns out he's not he, the white he's man. very easily he's easily so easily manipulated i mean just on a flip of a coin literally <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that's that's what we literally see and man and i think in the greater scheme of things, that that movie works a lot better. That that movie and the Joker works a lot better yeah. uh, than than Thanos does. Because imagine yourself this now. As I said a moment ago, I'm not a comic book fan, but any other, no, you know, you could have removed, um, for example, Ultron and place him in Infinity War and 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 Endgame, and he, he there would have still been ways of working him in that as the as a super villain right uh yeah. galactus uh apparently is a, is an even more powerful villain um com- uh, compared to uh, uh thanos apparently in the comics he's he's uh, he's he's one of uh thanos's uh, arch nemesis uh, arch nemesis so there's 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 that you know the the notion the, the role of the villain could have been fulfilled uh in in the mcu uh with with, with someone other than thanos but Honestly, I, I just can't think of someone making as huge an impact mm-hmm. uh, in the uh, Nolan trilogy, in the Dark Knight trilogy, as Heath Ledger's interpretation of the sure. Joker is. And I still haven't. Is well, is the one with Joaquin Phoenix out yet? No, no my God. God. the Joker. Wait. That should be really good. He's That's a terrific. Awesome. I mean, he's amazing. He he already, as of at a very young age, actually played one of the best villains in movie history. He was the gladi- he was in, in the Gladiator. gladiator? Yes. I was gonna say I, I genuinely hated that guy. Yeah, right. Yeah. You could honestly, you could honestly see yourself yeah. like grabbing yeah. a, grabbing <laughs> a gladio and running after him, yeah. and yeah. Like, yeah. or to, to just you know just that, that, that last moment when oh, you know yeah, yeah. General feels, Maximus yeah. just just like and sees the white of his eyes, and the guy probably yeah. you know. Uh, so it's very satisfying. You're right. Yeah, you genuinely hate him. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what makes a good actor. I yeah, guess. that's exactly the, the, yeah. the sort of actor you want who can yeah. fill those old shoes. And apparently, his interpretation is going to sort of be an origin story on the Joker. Yeah, like the classic. Yeah. Before it's not going to be a Batman movie, apparently. It's uh, more like, no. Yeah. No. So, That'll be uh, interesting. But, and uh, on the other hand, I've all, also not seen the. Uh, Jared Leto's one? Yes. Suicide Squad. Don't. It was sad. No, the guy so got literally uh, six minutes of screen time, and that doesn't do anything. Like you, they didn't give the guy a chance. So we, we basically see like a Middle Eastern uh, um, uh, Joker who's like always jealous about his girl. You know, like how dare you talk about my girl? <laughs> it just, just you know kills uh, Common's character. That's I, I only saw the clip. I haven't seen yeah. Suicide Squad either. So yeah. it's a good it's a good movie, but I think they didn't give. No, nah, I'm sure I'm sure you watched the right. There was a, there was a music video by Rick Ross. I don't know if you know. Him. But uh, the Joker gets more screen time in that uh, music video than the actual movie. What? And I'm not exaggerating. That's, that's, that's how it is. Uh, but so. another person, a uh, great person to uh, follow about um, superhero movies is the uh, director Kevin Smith. Uh, the, uh, he's also of the he's duo critic. Uh, critic, but he's a movie director himself. Oh, yeah, so yeah, he's yeah. someone you know one should really follow. And and super. Well, uh, super knowledgeable about superhero movies because he's been a comic book fan since since he was a kid, and he he's also the the sort of bearded, uh, somewhat overweight guy in the Silent Bob and Jay uh, duo. The, these guys appear in a lot of 1990s, late mm -hmm. 1990s and 2000s movies, and you know movies with like Mallrats. Um, um, uh, uh, they have several movies in their name, but the f movie Dogma with Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. Yeah. It's a sort of Parody of Catholic dogma, but it's also a very pro-Catholic movie. So, really smart movie about you know religion and God and the devil and stuff. And right. For a I change, know. Matt Damon and Ben Affleck are actually playing the bad guys, <laughs> but it's a super hilarious movie. They 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 appeared in a couple of other movies, but Kevin Smith has extensive commentary on YouTube uh, on, okay. on on these things. You know his his story about how he almost uh, directed uh, the movie. Um, uh, the uh, the Superman reboot in oh, the really? late 1990s. Apparently, he, he blew up big with a couple of his movies. Okay. And apparently, Warner Brothers and this huge producer who was going to bankroll like 30% of the Superman reboots, like got him to try to convince him to uh, 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 like insert a giant arachnoid and a giant spider in the movie. And then apparently, the idea found its way its its way into another Will Smith movie. Wild Wild West. So oh yeah, that's a good one. He 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 comments about that. Well, it's actually not good. I would take issue with the Wild notion. Wild West. Wild Wild West is, if you don't watch it seriously, yes. But yeah, apparently, yeah. the movie was originally made with like a with some serious intent, and then everyone oh, really? stopped taking. Apparently, it's Will Smith's <laughs> least favorite movie in the movies he was in. Like he has, he has very little. He has very little respect. For, but of course, I'm sure he's ma still making hundreds of thousands of dollars in royalties oh, from that movie every year. Because it's popular. It's like a. You know, a movie you watch, it's a popcorn it's a, it's and coke, a, yeah, and yeah, some yeah. silly stuff you can watch with your kids. If it's on TV, I'll he definitely watch it. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Smith. Oh, is that, yeah, that, yeah. that's not so, which was a pretty good movie. You, yeah. you think it was good? I, did, uh, I thought it was I, I did watch all of them, but honestly, I think the best screen movie is still the original. The first yeah, one. of course. So. Do you like horror movies? <laughs> not anymore. I used to like them. Like they would give chills down my spine. But after superhero movies, like I can't watch horror movies seriously. Yeah. And also because of you know, uh, from a metaphysical point of view, I can't take the notion of you know something coming from Paranormal. the metaphysical, from the paranormal coming in. I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna read a verse from the Quran and chase <laughs> you with a Mjolnir. You know, you, you know, like so. Uh, even though I'm not a particularly religious person myself, I'm not religious by any stretch of the imagination. But. All right, so um, we're running out of Camry battery. Uh, Good. Ca camera battery. You say Camry? Camry? <laughs> Camry. <laughs> yeah, but um, we've had a lot of fun. It's been an hour and a half. That's how you know. You know, it's really? going to be a good podcast. Yeah, I feel hour. like it's only been 30 minutes. Hour, exactly. I want to keep going. <laughs> we, we, love, we, we love when that happens, honestly. But uh, we've had a blast as well. We hope those who watched had a blast. And more than anyone, we hope that you had a blast. I had a great time. Thank you so Perfect. much. Perfect. Okay, fun. so um, everyone who's watching, like and subscribe. Uh, you know, retweet all that good stuff that helps us produce more good stuff. So, um, yeah, till then, thanks, Mr. Barron. Thanks again, Sam, for joining us. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, have a good one. Take care.